Hello. Last week, I started a series called Cloud Native Ninja. And in the kickstart video, I talked about some of the factors which is making cloud adoption popular. And as a result, the cloud native applications are also becoming popular. And there are many people who are now moving to the applications which are built using cloud native technologies. I named this series as Cloud Native Ninja. And in this video, we are going to start looking at the application and some of the things which are required for building the cloud native applications. My name is Nilesh. Let's get started. So the application that we are going to build is called as the Tech Talks application. Think of this application as the one which is used for managing uh, Tech Talks kind of events. So we will have a front end which is developed using React, for example. Then there would be two APIs, one which is producing the list of Tech Talks, which we call as a Tech Talks producer, and then there would be a consumer which would be consuming these tech talks. In order to decouple this, we will use a message broker and we will start with using RabbitMQ as the way of decoupling the producer and consumer. In terms of the programming languages which we are going to use, I want to demonstrate how to use polyglot programming for developing microservices. That is one of the features which allows us to use different programming language within the same application based on the type of application or based on the needs of the application. So we are going to use different programming languages like .NET Core, Java, Go and Rust. I start off this with a GitHub repository. So if you want to follow along, you can head over to this GitHub repo named as Cloud Native Ninja in my uh, GitHub uh, profile and you can start following uh, the list of things that I have. I basically developed on Windows Windows 11. So the setup that I have mentioned here or the tools that I have specified are Windows specific. But most of them uh, in terms of the technologies or the development tools that I use, they are cross platform. So except for things like Windows Terminal and Windows Subsystem for Linux, other things such as the Docker Desktop, Visual Studio Code, IntelliJ, uh, the Kubernetes CLI, kubectl, Helm, all these are cross, cross platform tools. So if you prefer to develop on Mac, you can still use these tools and you can still follow along. In terms of the programming languages, as I said, we'll be using .NET Core, Java, Go, Rust uh, for the backend processing or for the APIs and uh, React.js as the front end. So you can install this for your uh, operating system. And then I've listed down various things that we will be doing as part of these series, like starting with containerization, then moving the application to a orchestration platform like Kubernetes, uh, implementing CI CD, and then the cloud services integration with things like the key vaults, then infrastructure as code and observability, GitOps, chaos engineering, so on and uh, so forth. So if you would like to help on some of these topics, I'm developing this in the open source way. So some topics, I'm not currently very familiar with them. Dev containers, for example, I need help and I need uh, to explore this. If you already know about this topic and you would like to contribute to this series, I'm more than happy to accept the contributions. You can replicate this or you can clone this repo and you can make the changes. You can raise a pull request and I'll be happy to merge those changes. If you're interested, you can also work with me on my YouTube channel. You will get an opportunity to discuss about these topics as part of this series. So that is also an opportunity for you to showcase your skills in case you would like to collaborate with me on my YouTube channel. So with that, uh, let's get started with the first thing that we know. So I'll switch back to the uh, slides. Now, uh, we have a dependency on uh, RabbitMQ here. And before we start developing the code, let's say I want to set up my machine uh, with all these tools that I need. In terms of the code editors or IDs, uh, since it takes some time, I've given the links in that GitHub repository. You can follow those links to install those IDs and the software. But one thing which is required is the RabbitMQ. And I will show or I will use uh, this as this session as a way of setting up RabbitMQ and see how we can use it. If you have seen any of my earlier videos, 
uh, I'm a big fan of using package managers for installing software on the laptops or on the machine. And I use Chocolaty. I've done video in the past on how to use Chocolaty. And Chocolaty can be used for installing all those softwares. So feel free to watch that video or whatever way you want to install the software. And once you are ready, you can come back and we can continue from there. So assume that we have to have message broker and RevitMQ is the software or the message broker that we need on our laptop. Uh, if we have to set up the message broker like RevitMQ, it involves a lot of steps and it might be very specific to certain kind of operating system in the earlier days uh, we might have used something like a vagrant it's again a tool which allows us to automate some of these processes and we can set up like a development environment we can create a vm using vagrant and we can install uh, tools inside that nowadays this is not that popular or this is not uh, the ideal way i would say that containers uh, they make life very easier for us and we can use docker for this docker is one of the way in which uh, we can containerize the application we get all the dependencies and whatever is required for running a particular application as part of the docker package which is called as an image we download this image on our machine and then we run that image so let's get started and see how we can use docker for this so uh, if you don't have docker i suggest you start with uh, docker desktop that's a, a client side tool which is available again as a cross platform tool you can install it on windows i'm also using windows terminal uh, which allows me to have the tabbed interface and it has things like auto completion it allows me to have the personalization so if you have not used windows terminal uh, you can also start using that the first thing i want to do is uh, check if docker is installed and even before uh, checking if docker is installed or not as i was talking earlier uh, we can use the chocolatey package manager to see if uh, docker is available first of all let's start, uh, start by checking if chocolatey has the uh, docker desktop package so we can use choco search command and give the name of the package which is docker desktop to search If there is a package available for Docker Desktop, we will see the list of those packages when we run the search command. So there are two packages listed here. Uh, one is uh, Docker for Windows, which was the old version uh, before Docker Desktop came into the picture. And there is Docker Desktop 4.16.2 version, which is the latest version available as part of the chocolatey packages. If you want to install, we can use the choco install and then name of the package, which is uh, Docker desktop in this case, uh, as the install command. And uh, once this is done, once we run this choco install Docker desktop command, it will install Docker desktop on our machine. I already have this installed. So once the Docker desktop is available, we can go to the start menu and if we search, we will have the Docker desktop app available and we can use the run as administrator option here to start Docker desktop. So once we log in or once we start the Docker desktop, this is the default UI that we are presented with. And we also have the Docker desktop running in our taskbar. If we right click here, we can also find various other options related to things like the dashboard, the settings, if there is any update uh, to update the software we can also troubleshoot there is an option also to switch to one windows containers by default uh, docker runs the containers as linux containers but there might be specific case where we want to use windows containers as the option in that case uh, we can use the switch to option windows container uh, to switch from linux containers to windows container a typical example could be like running a windows nano server uh, for running windows specific containers but i will keep the default which is the linux one and then we have uh, other things like connecting to docker hub extensions running a kubernetes uh, cluster with one single node we can pause restart and we can quit the Docker desktop. so uh, once we log into the default one uh, 
there are some things which I would like you guys to have a quick look at. Go into the settings and uh, we can have the general settings uh, customized. Make sure that we are using this use the WSL2 based engine as the option. If this is not enabled, uh, once you have Windows subsystem for Linux installed on your machine, enable this. This allows us to have a better performance. If we don't have WSL2 or Windows subsystem for Linux, to version it would use a hyper-v uh, use a uh, hyper-v backend which will create a small vm and it will have a overhead of connecting to that vm for running the uh, docker daemon with wsl2 we have native integration with the linux kernel on windows and that allows to have a much better performance in terms of the integration between docker desktop and the wsl2 the other thing we also have to take care is under the resources uh, if we are using the wsl2 backend then the resource limits are managed by windows but if you want to override that we can do so by configuring the override values in this wsl config file i'm not going to do that at the moment but the thing that i want to highlight is the wsl integration part where there might be multiple uh, instances or multiple versions of uh, Linux which we can run as part of WSL2 and on my machine I have the Ubuntu version there is Debian there is uh, Rancher desktop uh, the Podman machine and uh, Rancher desktop data these are the different flavors of uh, Linux which I have on WSL2 distributions whichever one I want to have the integration with Docker desktop I need to enable them once we have these two set up, we are good to go. So the default thing, when we start, we will see that the Docker desktop UI has a list of options we can navigate through, starting with the containers. I don't have any container right now running. So it gives me the default things like how to run a sample container. There is a Redis container available. If I want to run Redis, I can just click on Redis. I can also do a similar thing with Postgres and Nginx. So uh, these are like getting started or quick starts. Then we have the images where whatever images we have downloaded on our machine or we have built and uh, available for us to run on this particular post, we will see that in the list of images under local and up. So under local, I don't have anything right now. It is empty because this is like a new installation of a Docker desktop. Hub is a connection to a container registry. Now think of container registry as a place where we publish our Docker images or container images. And Docker Hub is a public container registry. By default, again, if we don't override the settings, uh, the Docker desktop connects to Docker Hub and that is where we can see I have some images published to uh, Docker Hub. I'm also connected. So if I click here on the profile icon or uh, this link, I can see the account settings and I can connect uh, to Docker Hub using my Docker Hub credentials. But you don't need this for the public images but uh, we will see in the later parts where we want to publish our own container images or our own custom application specific images. We will need to have an account with uh, Docker Hub or other container registry where we might need to publish the images. So for now, uh, it is enough for us to know that by default, Docker Desktop will connect to Docker Hub. And then uh, whatever we download from there would be shown in here. There is also the option for uh, seeing the list of volumes and other things like the extensions, dev environments. Now, what's the difference between an image and a container? Image is like a template. So if we go back to the programming, think of a Docker image as a class in a programming language, which defines what are the different attributes and what are the different functions. So same way, an uh, image in Docker is like a template which has all the dependencies and whatever uh, code or whatever binaries are required for running a particular application. It's a self-contained image which we can use and create multiple instances of that image. And those instances are called as containers. So a container is equivalent to an object in a 
uh, object oriented programming language so uh, image is like a class and a container is an instance of that class uh, so if we want to create a container the easiest thing is to look at uh, something like hello world or getting started and docker desktop gives us this by default so we can have a getting started container by running this command which is docker run and for that let's switch back to the terminal again before i run that command uh, you can verify that docker is correctly installed and everything is running by running this command on the terminal docker info if everything is fine then we will see uh, details about uh, what is the client version of the docker we are using uh, and what is the server version if there are any containers uh, which are running or paused we will get that information as well so we can see the version here 20.10.22 as the server version and on the client side we will again have the client is uh, docker build uh, it's on 0. Point, like docker scan is 0. 0.2.3 there are 0. 0.2.17 for docker extension so uh, the docker desktop packages various other things like docker compose and they all have their own different version so docker info will give us that information about what are the uh, versions for our client software and the uh, docker daemon for example once we have docker running uh, then we can run that command so i've copied that command for the uh, starting getting started what we are doing here is we are running a command saying run the image from docker whose name is getting started and we want to expose the port 80 which is on this particular image the image is exposing a port and we want to map it to port 80 on our local machine and hyphen d is to say run it in a detached mode we can have what is called as a, a interactive mode as well which means that when the image runs we can uh, hook our terminal to the standard output of this particular image and we also see here that it says unable to find the image locally so docker has this concept of caching the images if we already have the image when we run this docker run command it will not uh, get this or it will not download this image once again so in our case there was no previous version of this image available locally on my machine that is why it went and pulled that image from docker hub and we can see that there are different layers within that image. So a template, which is the Docker image, consists of various uh, instructions, how to build that image or how that image is built. And each of that instruction get converted into what are called as layers in Docker. And this particular image, the getting started, has got all these different layers and they get put. The advantage of this is, if let's say the bottom three layers are reused between two different versions, Docker is intelligent enough to know that those layers already exist on my machine and it will only pull the delta from the other image. We will see these things later as we progress in this particular series. So now we have the image downloaded and we also have it running. We can go back to the Docker desktop and verify that the container is running we can see that it is named as kind iphone uh, or underscore yonath if we don't specify any name docker will give these kind of names to the running instance of our container the image is the docker getting started image we can see the status is running the port is 8080 where we did that mapping and it started about two minutes ago we can also see other options when we click on these three dots uh, we can see the details we can open a terminal to connect to that running instance of the container we can pause the container we can restart and we can open it in browser let's go back to the image before we come back here and if we look at the image and the local section now we see that this one image is now available it is the one which got downloaded the tag is the latest tag and currently it is in use because we have a container running based on this image it shows in use this image was created about 30 days back and the size of that is 
approximately 47 MB. So we can see that these containers or these images are very lightweight in nature and they contain only the things, the packages which are required for running a particular application. Now let's go back to the running instance of that image and see some of the things that we can do. I will click on this ports section and it opens the application. It is basically opening localhost 8080 and the tutorial. So this tutorial application or this getting started image has the uh, list of things that are required for getting started with Docker. They actually packaged it as an application and they give it as a getting started guide. And it has things around how to update the app, sharing the app, how to use persistence when it comes to databases, uh, how to mount things, how to use Docker Compose, all those things. And it tries to explain what did we do as part of that Docker run. Now, this is running locally on my machine and this think of it like a website, which is part of that particular image is now up and running. It didn't take us even like few seconds to have this fully uh, running application. Now let's go back to the uh, Docker desktop again and look at some other details. If I click on view details, it will show us things like the logs uh, which are associated with that image. When the image started running or when the container started running, these were the logs which were written to the standard output and we can see that as part of the details of the logs. We can also inspect in terms of where the image is running and what are these, uh, some of uh, the environment variables like the Nginx version which is used by this particular image is 1.23.3. Uh, it has a path. We can also go and connect our terminal. So it is like uh, executing into this particular container or logging into the running instance and uh, since this is a Linux based image, if we run the ls command, we can see what are the different uh, directories which are present in that particular image or in that container when the image is running. We can also create things like let's say I want to create a folder then I can run mkdir command and let's say Nilesh is the name of the folder. I can then navigate to this and if I want to create a file, let's say use a vi editor and if I create a new file, my file.txt and uh, I write some content. This is a sample content and then I will close this file or I will save this file. Now, if we list, we can see that the file is created. So basically, whatever operations we want to do on a Linux uh, environment, we can do it by connecting to this terminal or uh, entering into this running instance. And we will also see the stats in terms of how many resources are used. We can see the running instances taking less than 7 MB, which is what I was saying earlier that these Docker containers or Docker images are very lightweight in nature. Let's go back to the containers and see what else can we do. So we can pause the container which is running. We can restart and we can again open it in the browser. Uh, Let's go back to the images level and see at the image level what can we do. So if we right click or if we click on these three dots here, uh, we can see the details of the image. We can pull the image again down and we can push the image to Docker Hub. So if I'm building this image locally of my application, I can also push it back to the uh, container registry. If we click on view details, uh, we see things like the image hierarchy and the different layers. In the image hierarchy, we can see how the image was built and we can see it starts from Alpine 3. Alpine is one of the smallest distribution of Linux which is less than 5 MB in its size and we can really get started very quickly. It just has very bad minimal uh, things related to running a Linux operating system. On top of that, 
there are other things which are added for this getting started and we can see the different instructions which i was talking about earlier like adding a file then running a cmd command label uh, the environment variables here uh, the copy of different instructions or different files and all these are uh, converted into the layers in this image and in the recent versions of docker desktop we also see if there are any vulnerabilities in the image present so let's go back and uh, let's say i want to delete this image or delete this container the container is currently running what happens if i delete the container once i delete the container the application stops running so if we go back and if we refresh the uh, localhost page we see that the application is no longer available because that running container is deleted but the image still exists which means that i can now recreate this image and i can rerun it uh, whenever i want and whatever i showed using the user interface all that can also be done using the command line there is a docker cli available uh, using which we can run all these same commands so uh, i will show just one command here but if you want to uh, learn more about the different commands which docker offers or docker cli offers we can use the help menu or help command to know all the commands which are supported by docker so we have things like uh, the management related commands docker compose docker config uh, managing the docker containers uh, managing the context for the docker engine and things like that and then uh, the commands for running the containers and the images attached the build command create command things like that and then specifically each command that we have that also has additional uh, sub level commands or uh, parameters that can be specified so let's say i want to have docker run and i want to know what are the different parameters which are required for running the docker run command i can again use the help command to know more about the documentation or the features of that command and here you can see these are all the parameters the command line uh, arguments that we can pass to the docker run command what we saw earlier was just a very small thing like docker run uh, and we gave only three or four different parameters but the list is quite huge and you can go through uh, the explanation of what each of this parameter helps us to do and if we are running we can also have things like so let's go back and run that same command again uh, getting started and i'll show you the logs part the logs that we saw in the docker desktop we will be able to see it here as well so first let's run one more instance because we stop that running container so the container is started now when we have docker run and you can see that immediately within seconds it is up and running so if i go back and if i refresh this the application is uh, running within less than five seconds i would say so that is one of the advantage of having uh, docker or containers they are super fast to start uh, the startup time is very very fast so if i want to look at let's say the logs of this container then i can run the docker logs command and i can give uh, let's first see before we run the logs what are the processes which are running so if i use docker ps it will list all the processes showing that this container id is b673 uh, uh, the huge number then the image which is used and the name again is uh, pre-assigned by docker because i didn't specify name as the parameter it is determined harman something so uh, let's copy this and we will use this to identify the logs so i can then do docker logs and then give the name of the image 
or name of the container that I want to see the logs. So this will give us like uh, on the command line, the same option that we saw on the UI. Some people, they prefer the user interface of Docker desktop. Some prefer the, uh, some people, they prefer the CLI based approach. So either way, we are connecting to the same container. So we should be getting the same information based on your preference. You can either work with the UI based Docker desktop or you can work with the uh, CLI here. Now coming back to our initial discussion about using RabbitMQ or setting up RabbitMQ using Docker. There is a RabbitMQ image available on Docker Hub. There is an official image provided by RabbitMQ, which I am going to use. So if I go over to hub.docker.com and RabbitMQ uh, provided image, I can see that it has this uh, different tags and as I was saying earlier, think of tags as different versions of the image. So when it comes to tag, I like to equate it with the source code control management. When we talk about an image, we can think of it like a repository and then each tag is a different version of the image. So if we were to draw an analogy with uh, something like uh, git based repositories, the repository will be equivalent to uh, image in Docker Hub or a container registry and then tag is like the tag that we give or a version that we provide for our source code. So there are different supported tags here and there are different things which are available uh, to be uh, set as part of this RabbitMQ. It has different environment variables which we can override or which we can use and uh, we can set things like the memory limits and various other things uh, which if i don't have docker i will have to go download the binary or installer for rabbitmq and i will have to set these things manually uh, i will have to again look for the specific operating system like whether i'm doing it for linux or windows but i'm going to use again a docker and show you how it can be very easy to use rabbitmq the image provided by Docker. So the first thing we do is let's run RabbitMQ using Docker. So like we did for the getting started image, I'm going to use a Docker run command and I'm going to specify some parameters like uh, hyphen hyphen rm, which means that I want to remove the image or the container once I stop running it iphone it is to have an interactive terminal into the image host name i specify as rabbitmq the name for the image is or the name for the container is tech talks rabbit and i'm exposing or i'm doing port mapping for 5672 and 15672 and finally i use rabbitmq as the image from docker hub and the tag i want to use is 3 hyphen management which includes all the management utilities once again, we see that this image doesn't exist locally. So uh, Docker is going to pull the all the layers of this image for me and it is going to run this particular RabbitMQ. So once all these layers are downloaded, uh, we will see the running instance of uh, RabbitMQ. And since it is exposing 15672 management port, we will be able to connect to the uh, management UI of RabbitMQ. So looks like uh, the download is complete. It's extracting all the contents and uh, shortly we should be able to see the RabbitMQ running. While this is extracting, let me go and try to access the RabbitMQ UI which will be available on uh, localhost 15672 port. Uh, which I did the port mapping. So if everything is fine, if the RabbitMQ is running up and running, uh, we should be asking or we should get a prompt to provide the username and password to connect to the uh, RabbitMQ management UI. So here, uh, since I use that uh, hyphen it as the command line parameter, I have the interactive terminal 
which tells me what are the things. It shows me the logs which are being written by that RabbitMQ uh, uh, broker or the RabbitMQ server which is getting created. And let me refresh the browser. It is still setting up. It's starting the broker so we can see the log which says it is starting. So let's go back to the uh, Docker desktop for a while and see what do we see. Under the containers, we can see that the Tech Talks Rabbit is uh, showing as running status and we have 15672 and 5672, the two ports which are mapped and exposed here. So we should be able to see RabbitMQ UI now and we can see that prompt coming up asking us to specify the username and password for the management UI. So the default user is guest and it has the same password. Let's cancel here. Okay. Let's try the combination here for the default username and password. And then we are connected to the RabbitMQ uh, management UI. So we can see uh, the user is guest and it's connecting to the RabbitMQ, which was the host which we specified uh, while running this uh, RabbitMQ container. And then we can create a queue here. And under the queues, we can add, let's say, Tech Talks queue. and add so with that just by running this uh, one single command we have the complete rabbitmq broker and all the software that is required along with the management ui available to us and as we saw it did not take us even one minute to have this setup imagine doing this uh, by going through the installation guide and installing it locally on your machine i'm pretty sure we are not going to achieve it in less than one minute so uh, again, one of those advantages of having Docker and having that flexibility to set things up very, very quickly. The other thing that I want to show is how to override some of these things. Now, uh, in this case, uh, when we ran that command, we were using the default user and the default password. From a security point of view, that might not be an ideal scenario. We might want to override those things and provide uh, more secure username and password. So we are going to do that now. I stopped the running instance. So because I had provided hyphen hyphen rm as the flag, we see that under the containers now, the container is removed once we stop that running instance. I'm going to run a slightly different command now to override the uh, username and password. We will use the same image or we will use the same uh, downloaded image under the images for uh, RabbitMQ and the tag we can see here is 3 iPhone uh, manager that's the one we are using. Uh, current status shows that it is unused and this whole image is just about 257 MB in size. So let's go back on the terminal and run this command which is going to run a similar command as earlier, but we are providing two additional things here with hyphen E, which is for the environment variable. We are overriding the default user and I'm giving avatar as the name of the user. You can give whatever you want. And same way the password is James Bond 007. Uh, I'm sure this is not the most secure password. It might appear in some of the passwords which are leaked over the internet, but uh, you get the crux of it. This is how we can override the defaults. And when I run this command, again, quickly, the instance is created or the container is created, which we can verify by going back to our uh, Docker desktop, uh, where under the containers now, we have uh, Tech Talks Revit again appearing. It is running just 15 seconds ago. And if we go back to 15672, 
this is the new instance of our Revitem Q broker. So it should ask us again for username and password. And this time we should be providing the new credentials. So let's look at the logs once again because uh, it takes a bit of time to run all the things uh, initially. So we can see in the logs somewhere here that the user has been created with the name as avatar and it's starting all these uh, plugins like the default plugin for Prometheus, the management plugin, web dispatched and agent and uh, all the four plugins have been completed. So we should now be able to connect to this. So let's refresh the browser again and now we should provide avatar as the username and James Bond as the password, James Bond 007. Let's cancel, okay. It works here, avatar, James Bond 007. So now we are connected again back to the Revitum2 uh, management UI. But this time we started with a different uh, instance and we can go back look under the queues and we can see that there are no queues. In the earlier version, we created one queue named as tech talks queue, but that queue doesn't exist because we stopped the container and we recreated it. That is another concept we have to understand when we are running containers. Containers are supposed to be ephemeral. Whatever we create when the container is running, once we stop the container and we recreate it, those earlier information will be gone. If we want to persist that information, then we should use some way in which the container stores that information outside of the running container, which is called as a volume. And then we can mount that volume again next time we want to recreate the container. That is one way in which we can manage the state. But otherwise, mostly by default, the containers are ephemeral in nature. The moment we stop them, the moment we recreate the instance, all the previous information that was in that container is gone. So uh, that was about setting up RabbitMQ and we saw that it is very, very easy, very quick to set up the RabbitMQ using uh, Docker. So what did we do uh, in the past 20 minutes or so? We used Docker to interface or to interact with various things. Uh, when we set up the Docker desktop, it has these different components which are required for running the Docker. We have the Docker client. So we looked at two different clients. One is the Docker CLI and the other one was Docker desktop. Docker host is the machine where the Docker daemon is running and it has this images and the containers. And as I said, image is a template. It's like a class. The container is a running instance of that image. And there is a registry, which is the Docker hub in this case, from where we pull the images. So this is what we did. We used Docker desktop or we used RabbitMQ with Docker to have a better developer experience. I didn't have to think too much about what operating system to use, how to install uh, RabbitMQ, how to set up the environment variables, how to set up users, all that comes pre-packaged with all its dependencies in that image for Do uh, RabbitMQ, which is provided by uh, uh, or on the Docker image, which is uh, hosted by RabbitMQ. This is quite useful in the inner loop development where we don't have to depend on anything external. Whenever we are using things like databases, whenever you are using things like uh, Redis cache or uh, we are using things like Kafka, we can use uh, the Docker image for that and it makes life very easy for the developers. And in terms of the container registry, I talked a bit about Docker Hub, which is the public container registry. There are other registries available, which uh, based on your organization, we might be using things like Azure Container Registry if we are running applications on Microsoft Azure. There is the Amazon ECR, 
provided by AWS. There is Google Container Registry, GitHub provides a container registry, JFrog, all the tools providers, again, they have their own version of container registry. These are all based on a standard called as Open Container Initiative or OCI. Yeah, and that is why uh, the same container image can be pushed to any of these container registries. We will talk about this later in details in this series. So some of the things why we should use containers is uh, it gives us a very consistent development environment. Uh, let's assume that you have a, a team of uh, different programmers or developers and they need to have the same version of the software as we saw with uh, RabbitMQ within a split of seconds, uh, less than five to 10 seconds, we can have a instance of RabbitMQ running. And by using that tag mechanism, we can make sure that everybody in the team uses the same version of RabbitMQ. There is no uh, drift because let's say one developer is using 4.6 version of RabbitMQ, whereas the other one is using uh, 4.5 or somebody is having a very outdated version by using containers we can make sure that everybody is using the same version and it gives a consistent development experience for everybody in the team these containers they are very lightweight as we saw they are less than uh, 250 mb in size for the complete RabbitMQ package itself everything that is required for running RabbitMQ is available in that 250 mb download and they are very uh, lightweight, which makes it very fast to pull these images and to start this uh, in terms of performance. We saw that it did not take us even 10 seconds to spin up a RabbitMQ uh, broker or RabbitMQ server. There is also isolation. So if I talk about isolation or if I want to look at isolation, I would go back again to the uh, Docker desktop and look at the images and the details. Let's look at the containers first. We have two containers running. Uh, one is this RabbitMQ, the other one is getting started. And if we look at the details, let's go into the images for this and let's look at the image details. First, RabbitMQ. When I do view details, we can see that this image is based on uh, Ubuntu 20.04. And if I look at the other one, the getting started image, as we saw earlier, this was based on the Alpine. So I have two different distributions of Linux running on my uh, Docker desktop here. And that way, it is still able to provide the isolation between two different versions of the operating systems, which again makes it very easy in terms of having uh, different types of softwares running which might be having different uh, requirements for the operating systems. And the last point is uh, differences in the programming versions or the softwares. Uh, let's say within the same programming language, you want to use uh, different versions of the language. Java, for example, if you want to use uh, for one project, Java 11 or Java 8, and for another proof of concept, you want to use Java 19, we can use different versions of the Docker images for OpenJDKs, one for the Java 8 or Java 11 and the other one for uh, Java 19. And it is again very easy to switch between these two. We don't have to install this on our laptop. By using the right version of the Docker image, we can switch between uh, programming language versions as well as the uh, software versions. Uh, most of the providers of software like RabbitMQ in this case, they also provide different versions of their images. So that makes life very easy to use. So if you are following along this Cloud Native Ninja series, you can head over to the GitHub and you can have a look at this repository. The slides from the previous session as well as this one are again available on SlideShare and Speaker Deck. Here are some of the links that I used during this discussion. Uh, Docker getting started, then uh, Docker Hub for the different types of container registries that we have. If you want to understand more about this and you want to understand which one is more suited for your scenario, you can go through that link, how to choose a container reg registry. Then there are Docker cheat sheets as well. So uh, what I showed in terms of the Docker commands, 
are a very uh, small subset of commands but uh, docker offers various things and there are cheat sheets available which you can refer to know more about docker we will use some of these commands later in the series but if you want to get started and you want to uh, get your hands uh, hands on experience with docker you can use these cheat sheets to play around with the docker images containers the uh, general commands so there is one uh, cheat sheet provided by docker itself and there is another one uh, which is also provided by uh, the Colabnix. So uh, this is a slightly different representation in terms of uh, the same commands which are available. So you can refer to any of this to know more about Docker and to do uh, hands on with Docker. So in summary, what we did in this session or in this video is to look at Docker desktop and some of the settings which are required like integration with the Windows subsystem for Linux, WSL and WSL2. Then manage the container images and uh, the containers itself or running containers and the images from uh, Docker. We also looked at the Docker CLI and specifically for our project that we are going to build the Tech Talks. We looked at RabbitMQ, which is one of the dependency that we have, how to spin up RabbitMQ using a Docker image. If you would like to know more about such things, in the past, I've done a series on 15 factor apps, how to build cloud native applications using 15 factor apps. And some of the things that I talked during this video are also related to uh, those best practices or things about 15 factors. So you can have a look at that. Uh, Docker is not just the container platform or the way to manage containers. If uh, for some reason you are not allowed to use Docker in your organization or Docker desktop, there are other alternatives like Podman desktop, which again, I did a video some time back. You can also have a look at that. In the coming days, uh, we are going to uh, use this Docker and in the next video, we are going to see how to connect to that RabbitMQ and also how to containerize our own code, our own application. In this video, we used a pre-packaged Docker image. In the next video, we will create an image from our source code and we will look at that. So uh, hopefully you found this session useful. If you want to know anything more about details, if you like me to create some detailed videos about uh, Docker, do let me know in the comment section and for any future updates to this series and uh, my YouTube channel in general, please subscribe to get the updates in real time or to get better updates and notifications. Thank you for watching this video. Until next time, code with passion and strive for excellence.